Welcome, Ben Mama. Now those of you who have been following my channel for some time will be very familiar with my greatest arcade game series, where I looked at the 20 most important coin-ops released in each year from the dawn of the industry in 1975 to the time when consoles started to catch up technologically, 1995. That was 20 games for each year across 20 years. 2020 vision I guess you could say. But after that timeline was completed I produced two more bonus videos. One looking at my own top 20 arcade games and another top 20 that was voted for by you, my viewers and the retro gaming community at large. I fully intended to stop right there and not do any more but then I ended up doing one on 1996. Not just because you, my lovely viewers, were asking for more of them but also because I was moving house and needed to make several weeks videos in advance making my usual video schedule impossible. And now we are in a similar position once again, because I'm going on holiday the same time that this hits and needed to make some more videos in advance. But I'm sure you'll be happy with this replacement though, given how popular this series has been. So what was so special about 1997 then, and what were the themes of that year? Well, fighting games were still the rage, with a few completely new titles, as well as additions to several well-established franchises. There were also plenty of new racing games, a staple of arcades to this day, and lots and lots of shoot 'em ups, continuing the revival of the genre from the year before. What was very noticeable though indeed, was a huge lack of innovation, with very few new and original titles. Almost all the games on this list are sequels and follow ups to existing franchises. That's not to say there was nothing worth playing though, as you'll shortly find out. And with those words uttered, I guess it's time to have a closer look at the 20 greatest arcade games of 1997. The very first thing about Rising's Bloody Roar was that it was actually created by Hudson Soft, yes, them of PC Engine and Bomberman fame. Known as Beast Riser in Japan, the key gimmick of this 3D fighting game is the ability to transform from a human into a beast. I suppose you could describe this game as a cross between two Sega arcade games in Alter Beast and Fighting Vipers, the latter because this also takes place within a walled fighting arena. The later PlayStation port is probably more well known than the arcade game, but this is a nice entry point. Nineteen ninety seven saw the three D returns of two very famous horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up series in both Gradius and its great rival Darius. But it's Konami's game that we're looking at first, because well, it's not as good, and you can probably see why already. Konami thought that adding three D graphics meant they had to give the game a new perspective, a turning Taito didn't choose to take, and this makes the game feel totally different. It's not a totally horrible game by any stretch of the imagination, it's just not Gradius and it's easy to see why they returned to making 2D entries after this brief experiment. In the early 90s, Sega became the racing game kings in the arcades, with titles like Sega Rally, Daytona USA and Manx TT, and then continued to cement a spot in the late 90s with games like this. Licensed from the famous motorbike brand of the same name, this game lets you choose one of five different riders and race around the streets of LA trying to reach the checkpoints in time. Harley Davidson contains a lot of ideas that were later used in the far more popular Crazy Taxi, most notably the open world nature of the game, licensed rock soundtrack and different characters. The Darius franchise has been a staple for Taito since its inception in 1987, with new games still arriving in the present day. Not including various home versions and spin-offs that came in between, G Darius is the fourth game in the series, and like many other games in this particular list, it was later ported to the Sony PlayStation. The most interesting new feature of G Darius is that it uses 3D polygon graphics, but still retains the same horizontally scrolling viewpoint. The multiple screens are gone now however, which is a shame as it gave previous entries a real point of difference. In 
It was a long time coming, two years to be exact, but in 1997 Midway finally unveiled the fourth game in their astoundingly popular fighting game franchise. The main reason for the delays in getting it out the door was that Ed Boon and his team had made the decision to use 3D polygon graphics to render the characters, rather than the 2D look of the first three games, which caused a lot of issues in the development process. This is why Mortal Kombat 4 looks somewhat ugly by today's standards, and the reception for the game was quite mixed due to its visual change, despite the gameplay largely remaining the same. It's fair to say that American football games never really struck it big in the arcades like other sports games did. I'm not really sure why that is, but I do know that Midway's NFL Blitz changed all of that. As well as being the first coil up rendition of Gridiron to feature an official NFL license, it also chose to take things a lot less seriously too. Midway charged the team behind the hugely popular NBA Jam with doing the same for another sport, and NFL Blitz was the result. So as well as only having seven man teams, there were no penalties, no substitutions, and some really exaggerated violence. The original Strikers 1945 turned out to be a pretty successful arcade game for creator Psycho, being one of the games that reignited the shoot 'em up craze in the mid 90s. It was described by many as a bullet hell update of Capcom's famous 1942 and its many sequels, and this second Strikers game is more of the same really. Jump into one of six World War II fighters and fly your way through eight levels of intense action, with the first four of those being randomised to add more variation. That's all there is to it really, but once again it proved to be a popular formula with plenty of home ports soon following. After the rather lukewarm reception to Street Fighter EX, Capcom went back to the drawing board and came up with a much better received Street Fighter 3, which was more like an evolution of Super Street Fighter 2, the game people expected previously. It still had a few new features of its own though, although these were somewhat borrowed from other Capcom fighting games, like the ability to dash and retreat, as well as super jumps and quick stands. The most notable new feature however was the Super Arts, a powerful special move similar to the Super Combo in the Alpha games. Midway managed to get a surprising amount of titles into this list, and here's another, in the form of Off-Road Challenge, which is actually a 3D sequel to the hugely popular Ivan Iron Man Stewart Super Off-Road, which lit up arcades 8 years before. And this becomes pretty clear once you start playing it, because the key to success here is upgrading and improving your truck as you progress through the game. Then there are also the collectible power-ups like nitros and crash helmets, as well as piles of cash that you can pick up as you race around each off-road circuit. Developed by the legendary Cave for arcade distributors Atlas, Dodonpachi is widely regarded as one of the best bullet hell shoot em ups of all time. In fact, it was only Cave's second ever game, with the first being this game's prequel Donpachi. This game didn't really do anything all that different, but what it did do was improve and enhance all the best elements of its predecessor. There are of course things like new weapons, new enemies and more levels, but everything will still feel pretty familiar. The game was later ported to home systems too, with the Sega Saturn port being very highly regarded indeed. I always felt that Rival Schools is rather underrated as Capcom fighting games go being overshadowed and forgotten in favour of the many Street Fighter and Marvel games. The key gimmick of this game is that you have to choose a team of two characters and then fight against another two character team. The actual fights however are one on one, with the partner only participating by being tagged in when the player has enough vigour to perform a team up attack. This makes rival schools a bit more tactical than most rival one on one fighters of the era. The sequel to the massively popular San Francisco Rush, Rush the Rock Alcatraz Edition, is rather interesting, and it's basically a port of the home versions of the original game, 
with a few small tweaks and improvements of its own. These include new cars, new tracks, including the titular Alcatraz race and improved visuals. However, the most important change is the addition of shortcuts, which allow you to cut out large sections of each track and get ahead of the competition. This game would then serve as the basis for the next Rush game with more small tweaks being made. The very first arcade footy game to use 3D Polygon graphics, the original Virtua Striker was a very profitable coin-op for Sega, so it was inevitable a sequel would follow. It took three years to come, but it was more than worth the wait, as Sega made huge upgrades to every area of the game. And in fact, Virtua Striker 2 was so good that the Japanese company would choose to improve and enhance the game three more times rather than release brand new sequels. It would become one of the highest grossing arcade games of 1997 and it was later ported to Sega's advanced Dreamcast console. Namco's Tekken series proved to be the biggest rival to Sega's Virtua Fighter games in the 3D fighting game space. And in fact, it's ended up outlasting it, as while Sega haven't released a new Virtua Fighter game in years, Tekken still gets new sequels and updates. This third game is notable for introducing a slew of new characters that have become staples of the franchise ever since. There were also a number of tweaks to the general gameplay to make it better balanced, which again were retained for all its sequels. Many actually regard Tekken 3 as the best game in the entire series. The direct sequel to Raiden Fighters and another spin-off from the regular Raiden franchise, this one is subtitled Operation Helldive and shares much of the same DNA as its predecessor whilst improving the concept in key areas, which seems to have become a theme in this 1997 list. The main new feature is the hybrid attack, which is only available in a two-player game, and lets two players link up with each other to use their charged attacks, which then activates the hybrid, rendering both players invincible for the duration of the power-up. It's also notable for its awesome soundtrack too. I absolutely loved Tetris Plus. I was totally addicted to the Sega Saturn version for a long while. So I was pretty excited to discover there was an arcade only sequel. This follow up adds very little to the affair however, and could probably be described as an update rather than a full on sequel, as the only major difference comes in the form of the enhanced puzzle mode. That now adds branching level paths, which introduces different settings and alternative endings. This lack of updates doesn't stop it from being one of the best puzzle games released in the arcades however, so go and give it a play. Zero Gunner is a pretty unique, for the time anyway, 3D shoot em up where you pilot a helicopter flying up the screen, blowing up the various air and ground based enemies. There are four stages to work through here that can be selected from the start, which all take place in a different part of the world and end in a boss battle. As well as your usual array of power ups, you also have the unique lock on feature. What this does is let you focus on a particular enemy and then move around it. Probably the best feature of Psycho's Zero Gunner, however, is a simultaneous two-player mode. You don't get that many two-player co-op shooters, especially ones like this, so this is a real bonus. Atari's Maximum Force is an unofficial follow-up to the excellent Area 51, and indeed later on Atari made a dual cabinet that included both games. Like its predecessor, it's also a light gun shooter that uses digitised graphics and video sequences to display all the action. In a time when 3D polygons have taken over the genre with games like Time Crisis, Virtua Cop and House of the Dead, it's nice to see a game that uses more traditional techniques, and it looks absolutely great. The press of the time actually criticised the game for this reason, but punters disagreed and it ended up being a very successful game for Atari. I was very, very tempted to put this game top of my list for 1997, because I absolutely adore Rampage in general and spent an awful lot of time playing this sequel in its Sega Saturn form. The game takes all the destructive gameplay of the original and gives it a brand new lick of paint, with some pretty significant improvements as you no doubt expect for a game that came out over 10 years after the original. 
as well as the new Pseudo 3D rendered visuals and digitised sounds, there are new enemies, new types of buildings, new things to eat and new locations, as the name alludes to. I just had to put Sega's amazing Jurassic Park arcade game in the top spot, because unlike the vast majority of games released in 1997, it felt like something genuinely new and different. I don't think a film had been so suited to being turned into a light gun shooter since Terminator 2 some six years before. You simply make your way around the park shooting dinosaurs, saving trapped visitors and picking up power-ups. The game is so enormously fun and still so fondly remembered, so much so in fact that it was remade by Raw Thrills in recent years for their own Jurassic World coin-op. And that rounds up my look at the greatest arcade games of 1997. Are there any others you can think of that should have made the list, or do you disagree with any of the entries that I did include? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons and YouTube backers for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, DOS Gamerman, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, Minz, 8 Bit Guy, Luke MC, Ben P. Stein, Colin Matorn, Tabby Kitsune, Alan J. Dodds, Daniel Skronsky, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been The Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.